Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is a special Saturday edition of our normal Fast Friday show for January 8th, 2022. And on this episode, I've got a pretty quick take on who's responsible for enforcing the limits of the Constitution on the federal government. And no, it's not about somehow magically getting the federal government to limit its own power. I've got tons of great quotes from founders and old revolutionaries to make the case. Plus, in one fell swoop, both good news and bad news to close it out from Thomas Jefferson. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We normally broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is everything you need to follow us. Uh, it's 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. You can find all the archives. You can find reference links for each episode for stuff that I talk about so you can read and learn more. You can find all the different platforms, the video platforms, the audio only podcast edition, and even our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and Liberty. The show homepage again is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here. But since this is the Saturday edition of the Fast Friday show, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And honestly, if you really just want to do the the TLDR, the TLDW, too long, didn't watch version. Let's start with a quote from John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution that I ended the last episode with. This was him writing in his Fabius letters, Fabius number four, arguing for ratification of the Constitution, April 19th, 1788. He's talking about the supreme sovereignty of the people. Sovereignty meaning final authority. And he said, it is their duty, the duty of the people. It is their duty to watch and their right to take care that the Constitution be preserved. Or in the Roman phrase on perilous occasions, to provide that the Republic receive no damage. So it is up to the people to keep their own constitution in check. But we've got a little bit more on that. If you want to wrap it up, that's cool. Thank you for being here, but let's go a little further. Here's James Wilson. So a lot of people call James Madison, the father of the constitution. You could technically call James Wilson that guy as well. Although he just doesn't really get the recognition. He was one of the big government guys of the time. Uh, maybe not uh, as far as Governor Morris or Hamilton, but definitely towards that direction. But here he is in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, December 1st, 1787, taking the same view on sovereignty, final authority. He said sovereignty resides in the people. Now, all through history, that sovereignty, that final authority, the founding generation recognized was primarily in the hands of government, in the hands of a single person, a king or a queen, uh, a small cabal of people, an oligarchy, something like that. And this system was something new, really, on Earth. Here's Robert Livingston, the chancellor in the New York Ratifying Convention, with the same type of a message that all power is derived from the people. Following up with George Mason in April of 1775, same message. All power was originally lodged in and consequently is derived from the people. So the source of power is the people's sovereignty. Final authority, therefore, rests with the people. And that's how it'll always be. Back to James Wilson. Here he is in the Philadelphia Convention. October 28, 28, 1787, he said that the leading principle in the politics of the time, the leading principle and that which pervades the American constitutions, of course, there was the Articles of Confederation, but the constitutions of each of the states, he said this is the leading principle. He said that the supreme power resides in the people. So that is once again an assertion of this final authority, this view of sovereignty being in the people, not government. And that's what Thomas Paine was really talking about here in Rights of Man, Part 1, 1791. He said a constitution is a thing antecedent to a government, and a government is only the creature of a constitution. So if we're going in order here, you've got government comes from Constitution. Constitution comes from where? He said the Constitution of a country is not the act of its government, but of the people constituting 
a government. So the people who decide they want to create a government, they draft up a constitution. And once the constitution is approved, the constitution then generates that government. So if you have to look at this order of who has authority and power to pain again, that sovereignty would be with the people. James Madison had a very similar approach in Federalist number 49. And he said, as the people are the only legitimate fountain of power, the only legitimate fountain of power, and it is from them that the constitutional charter under which the several branches of government hold their power is derived, it seems strictly consonant to the Republican theory to recur to the same original authority, the original authority, of course, being the people. Madison is using the same type of messaging here, arguing for ratification of the Constitution in the Federalist Papers in 1788 that uh, Thomas Paine was talking about a few years later in Rights of Man. He said it seems strictly consonant with the Republican theory to recur to that same original authority, not only whenever it may be necessary to enlarge, diminish or new model the powers of government. But also, check this out, whenever any one of the departments may commit encroachments on the chartered authorities of the others. We know in Federalist 48, Madison wrapped it up specifically saying that a mere parchment barrier, words on paper, even the greatest constitution on earth, he was saying this is not enough to keep the different departments from consolidating, from centralizing power, from encroaching on each other and creating a despotism. And there he is following up in Federalist 49, talking about the supreme power of the people, the original legitimate fountain of power that they can see if there's one branch consolidating or centralizing, taking powers that weren't delegated to it. It's up to them to deal with these encroachments on the chartered authorities of the others. Going further, a very similar viewpoint from the muse of the American Revolution, Mercy Otis Warren, in her observations on the new constitution in 1788. And she said this, the origin of all power is in the people and they have an incontestable right to check the creatures of their own creation. Here's Mercy Otis Warren pointing out that if same thing that Payne talked about, same thing that uh, Ma Madison was talking about that the Constitution is an act of the people or the people of the several states in this situation. And then the government is a creation of the Constitution. So the people who created it in the first place, they have an incontestable right to check them. It is not up to the government to tell the people, the creators, what they can do. At the end of the day, they have that final authority, that sovereignty and nearly a century later and i've talked about this a few times in recent episodes over the last few months in his great essay a defense for fugitive slaves 1850 the great 19th century writer lysander spooner was talking about the right to resist usurpation usurpation being an exercise of powers not delegated to the government in the constitution so every time they act outside that cons constitution they are usurping powers and spooner uh, wrote at length about how you don't have to, because the people have the final say, you don't have to wait for the government to tell you it's OK. It's absurd to have to say that you have to follow an unconstitutional law until it's repealed, because that would give an unconstitutional law the same legal force as a constitutional one. That is a destruction of the Constitution. He says the exercise of this right to resist usurpation by the people, he said, is neither rebellion against the Constitution nor revolution. He said it is a maintenance of the Constitution itself by keeping the government within the Constitution. So when government tries to do stuff it's not authorized to do, which is constantly what governments always do, and they will always try to expand their power. That is the nature of power. That's what Federalists and Anti-Federalists alike all recognize that so many people today just seem to forget. They only think that power is bad when the other guy has it or the other team has it. And that is leading to a complete destruction of all of our liberty. But Spooner pointed out just what everyone else was saying here, that you keep government in check by not allowing the government to tell us when it's in check. And this is the only way to, according to Spooner and many others, 
was through this right of resistance and opposition, peaceful resistance, noncompliance, and sometimes for Spooner, even a little bit further. Let's go back to John Dickinson, again, the penman of the revolution here in his uh, letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania. This is number six, I think, in 1767 against the hated Townsend Acts. And he put it this way, a free people can never be too quick in observing nor too firm in opposing the beginnings of alteration. So if you have a structure of government and soon as they go outside those bounds, if you are going to be a free people, a free people can never be too firm in opposing those. A free people are those who keep government in check on their own rather than waiting on government to, I guess, magically limit itself, which almost never seems to happen. And I want to wrap it up here. The good news and the bad news from Thomas Jefferson all in one fell swoop. This is in a letter to George Washington in January of 1786. He said, our liberty can never be safe, but in the hands of the people themselves. Never. Our liberty can never be safe, but in the hands of the people themselves. The good news. The people can protect their own liberty, no matter what government has to say about it. They do have the ability to do that. That's the good news. Government is never going to do the right thing. We should be aware of that. Sometimes they will by accident, a broken clock, right? And I don't even think it's as good as a broken clock because it's not right twice a day. It's constantly doing the wrong thing and always expanding its power. It's the largest government in the history of the world, and it's not even close. So the good news is that the people can do something about it. We do not have to wait for government to limit its own power. But the bad news is pretty bad news. And I hate to wrap it up with bad news. We live in a society that's absolutely dominated, and it's not even close, dominated by people who totally fear and despise the idea of you living free. They hate liberty. So we've got a lot of work to do, and that's probably the understatement of a century. Well, I hope this was interesting. I hope it was educational, more important than anything. I hope you learned something from this episode. I will link to all these original source documents in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. In case I haven't mentioned that one enough, I'll have that blog post published over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty in the next hour to two hours, uh, right as I wrap up the show here in a few minutes. Of course, if you want to support the show, you want to support our work at the TAC, whatever, you love the show, you hate the show, but you thought it was interesting, if you want to throw in a little uh, a little loot our way, two bucks a month is all it takes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Nothing, absolutely nothing helps us roll up our sleeves every single day to do this kind of work, to reach and teach people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend them more than the financial faith and support of our members. Please don't feel obligated to join us, but if you're able to, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Of course, reviews on Apple Podcasts, smashing the like button, leaving comments, subscribing, getting notifications on the video platforms, all that stuff helps spread the word a ton. It really does trigger those mainstream platform algorithms and tells them to show the program to more people. Again, I hope you enjoyed this quick take today. I hope you learned something. I hope you're having a great weekend so far, and I will see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.